Um, yeah. This meeting is being recorded. There you go. Great. Um, so I'm Bruce Herbert, and I'm a professor of agriculture and the former director of scholarly communications at Texas A&M Libraries. And it is my pleasure to introduce both my friend and colleague, Dr. Cynthia Werner. Um, Cynthia is a professor of anthropology, and so I really want everybody to look at the quality of that of her uh, bookcase in the background because it is quite um, quite nice. Uh, she's a professor of anthropology. She served uh, as the director of Texas A&M's Advanced Program um, for quite a while. Uh, and the Advanced Program uh, was working to create a psychologically healthy workplace at Texas A&M, uh, where all faculty can thrive and succeed. Um, and a key objective of this advanced program is to weave the values of diversity, inclusion, and respect into a culture of Texas A&M. Um, she currently uh, moved over, serves now as the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs in the new College of Arts and Sciences at Texas A&M. As many of you know, we've gone through an amazing uh, uh, reorganization on campus. And so uh, it is with deep thanks, given her workload that I know she has in formal, forming the, being part of the leadership team of the College of Arts and Sciences, that I uh, thank her for her willingness to come talk to us today. So thank you, Cynthia. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Thank you for that invitation. I'm happy to be here presenting this um, presentation on identifying and reducing potential sources of bias in the promotion and tenure process. I'll talk about how my um, understandings in promotion and tenure have evolved over the years as I've had different roles in relationship to promotion and tenure, first coming up for promotion and tenure, and then being a department head, then being the director of advance, and now being an associate dean who's developing new guidelines for the college that Bruce just mentioned. Um, on how to do faculty performance evaluations. But um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I'm gonna start the presentation by discussing a few promotion cases that have circulated um, publicly in higher education media and beyond. Um, all of the cases presented here have been discussed in the media, including the media on higher education. Uh, my presentation of these cases is based most pretty much on the media accounts. I don't have um, detailed understandings of these cases, which I'm sure are much more complex than what's been presented in the media. And I imagine that there's lots of details that are missing, um, especially though the perspective of the institution is most institutions do not talk about personnel matters in the media. So most of the information is coming from the candidate. Um, so the first case I want to talk about is um, Lorja Garcia Pena. Um, she's a Black Latinx scholar who was hired as a tenure track um, professor in 2013 in the Department of Romance, Languages, and Literature at Harvard University. Harvard, as you may know, has a notorious reputation for not promoting as many people. In general, their rate of tenure is lower than most um, um, R1 universities. Her research focuses on race and identity with special focus on Black Latinx diasporas around the world. At the time that she was hired, she was the only Black Latinx scholar um, in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. In 2019, um, she was courted by another elite university. And in response to that effort and an effort to retain her, her department said, why don't you go up for promotion early? So her chair and her dean encouraged her to come up early for tenure. She was reassured that she had a strong record. Um, at that time, um, she had published eight articles, four book chapters, and, and um, a book that had been published. She was working on a second book that was under review. Um, her teaching record was strong. She'd created a Latinx um, studies area of focus and received many awards for her teaching. She also had a strong record of service, including the mentoring of students from underrepresented groups, and she'd served on multiple search committees. Um, she'd received extremely positive letters um, from external reviewers. Her department and the college level committee unanimously recommended her 
um, for promotion. Her case, however, was denied at the university level by an ad hoc committee that was formed to review the case. This is a procedure that um, can occur at Harvard. And according to one internal document, the senior vice provost for faculty development cited that there was at least one scholar on that committee that described her forthcoming book as too narrow and complained about a low rate of external, a low response rate for request for external review um, letters. Her work was also criticized for being activism rather than scholarship. So you can kind of see where this was going. In writing about her own tenure case, um, Garcia Pena questioned whether there was an impermissible bias against my candidacy, as well as a discomfort animated by my activities in calling out racism and racist conduct on and around campus. During her time at Harvard, Garcia Pena endured discrimination and hostile racism, often in the form of violent threats with minimal follow-up and action. She also participated frequently in invisible labor as a faculty member who's supporting um, students from underrepresented groups. Um, there was one incident that involved a university security guard. She held extra office hours um, for students to give them the emotional support that they needed. Um, she comforted students from underrepresented groups regularly. Um, this is particularly international students and undocumented students. <clears throat> Um, Harvard has not disclosed the reasons for the tenure decision, um, but it's likely that the faculty member who criticized her book influenced the whole committee. Um, there's scholarship on this sort of subject about the, the role that one toxic committee member can play in changing the dynamics of a promotion decision. Um, the decision about Garcia Pena's tenure case angered many students, particularly those who had benefited from her mentorship. Um, they protested against this. They were pushing for an ethnic studies program at that time, and they linked these two things together. We need scholars like her to help us develop this ethnic studies program. There was a petition. There was a petition. Um, she filed a complaint against the university. After being denied tenure, her case was sent to the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. And ultimately, she succeeded in receiving tenure, and she's currently an endowed professor at Harvard University. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. This is a second case. Um, this is Dr. Paul Harris. <clears throat> he was initially hired into a non-tenure track position at University of Virginia. Um, he was then reclassified into a tenure track position. He specializes in counselor education with a special focus on investigating college and career readiness of students from underserved groups and the identity development of black male student athletes. Um, he developed a program called Men Passionately Pursuing Purpose. This is a counseling intervention program designed to support black male athletes in and out of sports. In 2014, his position was reclassified. In 2019 and 20, he's coming up for tenure. He had received positive annual reviews during his probationary period. And they consistently indicated that he had met or exceeded expectations. He came up for tenure and was initially denied. <clears throat> the Promotion and Tenure Committee's decision um, was largely based on their assessment of the quality of the journals that had published his research and an assessment that his research was not having enough impact. So they looked at the impact factor of the journals and said that they're not strong enough. Some of them didn't have impact factors, according to the committee. Um, some of their comments were erroneous, however, um, and they also said that his articles were not being cited at a high enough rate. They actually misrepresented his citation count as well. They stated that he had 50, about 50 citations when he actually had had about five times that many. Um, in his appeal, he pointed out these errors and also noted that the PNT committee lacked diversity. Um, there were no persons of color on the uh, college or department level committee. Um, his appeal was unsuccessful. But after public uproar, this is a case that got a lot of attention, especially at UVA, and the decision was reversed and he was awarded tenure. 
Um, his 10-year experience, however, left him with a bad taste in his mouth, and a year later, he left UVA to accept a position at Penn State. Um, next slide. So the same year <clears throat> at UVA, there was a second case <clears throat> involving a Black scholar who was denied tenure. This is Tolu Odumoso, who started his position at UVA, is an assistant professor of science, technology, and society in 20. 13. Um, this is a department that's within the college or school of engineering at UVA. His research looks at science and technology from a sociological perspective. <clears throat> His work focuses on the adoption and use of mobile communication technologies. Um, there had been some concerns raised during midterm review, and he responded to each of these concerns when he came up for promotion to his associate professor. Um, this included a recommendation that he increase his journal editing experience, which I will say as an aside is kind of an odd comment to make. Um, by the time he came up for tenure, his research record included a co-authored book on innovation and discovery that was published by Harvard University. Um, and he also was the co-PI on a $3 million grant from the National Science Foundation. The Engineering College's Promotion and Tenure Committee had a split vote and the dean voted against his tenure case. The explanations for the tenure denial were based on the perception that he'd not developed himself as an independent scholar. In particular, the Promotion and Tenure Committee remarked that his co-authored book was written with mentors. And um, even though one of his books was written with a colleague, not a, a mentor, the committee also downplayed his contributions to the NSF grant and um, several interdisciplinary research clusters. The college level committee also failed to understand different publication norms for research in science, technology, and society um, as this subfield compared to other disciplines in engineering. They were using the standards of one department to judge the standards within his own department. He himself feels that his case was impacted by racial bias and an assumption that he was riding on the coattails of his white collaborators. He also notes that his contributions in the area of service, particularly in diversifying various committees, was not sufficiently um, credited. He appealed the tenure case, but did not succeed in overturning the decision. He um, later moved to a new university where he's, in, he's now an associate professor at James Madison University. Um, next slide, I've got one more case I wanna talk about. Um, and this is Dr. Carolyn Chun. She's an assistant professor of math at the US Naval Academy. She's been denied tenure at least twice in the accounts that I can read. There's, I've heard that she's come up for a third time and I am not sure what happened with the third case. Um, she had six years of postdoctoral work and four and a half years of teaching at the US Naval Academy before she came up for tenure. Um, the decision to deny her tenure um, was based on student evaluations of teaching. Her students um, are predominantly male because she's at the U.S. Naval Academy. Um, she typically had just two or three women in her class, um, in a class of 25 students. Um, prior to her first tenure case, five male students had complained to the department that she was grading women differently than men after she made a comment about how there's a lower number of women in my class, but somehow women are always performing better. So she'd made this offhand comment during the class and then the men in the class held that against her and gave her poor student evaluations. And then this was something that was cited when she came up for promotion. Um, the US Naval Academy doesn't have a mechanism in place to ensure that bias in student evaluations does not factor promotion cases. Um, she had the unanimous support from her department um, to apply for tenure a second time. She implemented feedback from the 2020 um, briefing and um, thought that she'd have a different result. Um, and her annual performance evaluation noted that her teaching and service were fully successful, which is a high rating. And while her scholarship received the highest rating of outstanding, um, so she thought that she'd have a different result. She was confident in the outcome but once again, she was told that the decision was negative and that the decision was based on her teaching record and these student evaluations of teaching were coming into play again. Um, she, as a mathematician, was able to do the statistics and 
determined that at the U.S. Naval Academy, it was statistically um, showing that there was gender bias in this process. Um, there were 11 men and four women who came up for tenure in the same year. 10 of the men and none of the women were successful. So it didn't take a mathematician to come up with that result, but she was able to use her math skills to argue the odds of that happening. She appealed her case in 2021 and lost the appeal. Um, and as I mentioned before, she's, I saw one account saying she came up with her time and I'm not sure what happened on the website. She's currently listed as an assistant professor, but I don't know if they just haven't updated their site yet. Okay, next slide. So these cases have one thing in common. There is a candidate who perceives that there was bias in the review process on the basis of race and or gender. Um, next slide. So as I mentioned at the beginning, these cases as I'm presenting them are coming largely from the media. The media is largely representing the candidate's perspective. There probably is more complexity to these cases. As I know, as an administrator, promotion cases can be quite complex. So it's hard to know for sure what's happening without having access to the full dossier and without having access to the guidelines and expectations for promotion. But there's a lot here to suggest that there is bias going on and there's bias on it, a bunch of different points. And these are things that I have seen over my career. There's bias that disadvantages certain types of scholarship and types of scholarly activities. This was seen in several of those cases. Bias associated with different publishing norms across disciplines and even within a department. And then there's bias in assessing an individual scholar's contributions to collaborative projects. Who did what? Who contributed the most? And how should that be valued? And then there's bias in student evaluations of teaching. Um, next slide. So there's a lot of um, reasons why it's important to think about bias as it relates to promotion and tenure. This slide is probably pretty obvious, but it's worth pointing out that the promotion and tenure process is based on the premise that most talent, the most talented and most deserving candidates are going to be promoted. Institutions like to believe that their processes are fair and equitable. I am currently in the process of putting together a set of guidelines for a new college at Texas A&M. And I like to think that the processes will be fair, but I also know from my research on bias in promotion and tenure cases that we can't eliminate the possibility that there can be bias. The processes should be fair and equitable, but there is going to be bias as there is bias in all decision-making processes. Um, for tenure track faculty, a promotion denial um, can have serious consequences. It can be career damaging minimally. Um, nobody wants to be the job candidate who was just denied tenure or the job candidate that somebody thinks might have just been denied tenure. Um, for some scholars who are denied tenure, the decision can be career ending. One of my good friends from graduate school um, was denied tenure and that was the end of her academic career in anthropology. She went on to do something else. Um, for tenured faculty, denial of promotion to full professor can be emotionally difficult. The emotional stress can affect morale and productivity. I've seen people who've been denied that promotion who have not picked up the pace. They were on a positive trajectory and you can just see how it impacted their, their attitude and their self-assessment as well as their productivity. A negative decision can also affect long-term retention, especially if the negative decision started at the department level. Um, who wants to work with people who denied them the opportunity to be promoted? Um, it can also affect retention if the outcome is a, eventually positive if there were negative votes along the way or negative experiences we saw in the case of Paul Harris. Um, promotion denials can also have um, financial consequences given that promotions typically come with a significant pay raise. At Texas A&M it's typically 10 percent and I think that's not uncommon. Um, next slide. 
So my um, perspective on understanding promotion and tenure is based on a number of different life experiences that I've had and my understanding of promotion and tenure has evolved over the years. Um, my experience has been shaped by my own experience as a faculty member, both being someone who came up for promotion and then watched my colleagues come up for promotion, watched my colleagues at other institutions come up for promotion. So that's a starting point. Um, I came up for tenure in 2005, came up for promotion to full for professor um, 10 years later, which is a little later than average, but I was serving as department head at the time, which had slowed down my productivity. At both moments of time in my own promotion, I was very anxious coming up for promotion because my record didn't look like some of my colleagues in my own department. I'm in a department that has both um, book culture people and journal culture people and people in the humanities and social sciences. And some people are publishing with lots of co-authors and publishing in journals that have high impact factors and they have high citation rates. So for my first promotion, I was mostly worried about my record publishing in journals that weren't as well known and not having as many citations. And I did have some dings along the way. For my second promotion, I was worried about my pace of productivity because I had been serving as department head and that had slowed down the rate at which I was publishing. And as a cultural anthropologist, I'm a little unusual in that I have not published a sole authored book. So I was always worried about what external reviewers would be saying about my focus on journal articles rather than a book, which is the norm for my subfield within the discipline. So I was um, wrought with anxiety both times I came up for promotion. Everything ended up well, but it wasn't without a year of anxiety. Then I moved on to become the department head. Actually, between those two promotions, I became department head of anthropology. And during that time, I reviewed over a, a dozen promotion cases. I haven't counted them up, but there were a few unsuccessful ones, um, which was always challenging. Um, some of the cases were no-brainers. Some of them were more complicated, and including a few cases that were not successful at the end. A recurring theme in my department are differences of opinions on things like the use of scholarly metrics, whether it's impact factor of a journal or citation rates, also how to evaluate scholars who focus on writing books with versus scholars who focus on publishing in peer-reviewed journals. In my experience, those who have higher H indices um, publish in journals with higher impact factors, publish with co-authors and have more publications. And um, they always seem to have an unfair advantage over those of us who publish books and book chapters at a higher rate than we're publishing journal articles. And those of us who publish as sole authors rather than publishing in more of a social science model of having multiple co-authors. I've got colleagues who are archaeologists and biological anthropologists, and then those of the some of us who are cultural anthropologists and um, nautical archaeologists in my field who are more like classicists. Um, so my role as department head was to provide the context for understanding the departmental recommendations and assessments and even positive votes at the departmental level sometimes came with critical comments that I had to explain, but critical comments that could damage a case as the case moved up the levels through the college and university levels of review. Um, after serving as department head for eight years, I served as the director of the advanced program at Texas A&M. As Bruce had explained, Texas A&M received an institutional transformation grant from the NSF advanced program. The purpose of that was to improve the status of women faculty at Texas A&M. When I started as the director of advanced, the program was institutionalized and my job was to broaden the scope so that the programs and activities that had been initiated during the grant phase would be um, broadened to benefit all faculty across campus and not be focused just on women, but to focus on all scholars from underrepresented groups and underserved groups, as well as all faculty. Some programs are for all faculty in general. Um, one of the things that we did, um, which Bruce has been part of, was to expand the STRIDE workshop program, which is for faculty search committee members, so that all 
faculty who serve on the search committee um, participate in this training workshop that provides um, guidance on implicit bias and how to reduce implicit bias. We also developed a new workshop on promotion and tenure evaluations, which we called Stripe Strategies and Tactics for Retention Through Inclusive Promotion Evaluation. Um, and we have a wonderful committee that helped put together this workshop. And I will say more about the workshop in, in a few minutes. Um, in my new role as the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs in the brand new College of Arts and Sciences at Texas A&M, I am currently in the process of putting together guidelines for faculty performance evaluations, which include promotion and tenure. And this has been a challenging role because we have merged three different colleges, which all had different um, college cultures for handling promotion and tenure. And then I'm also trying to weave in things from the Stripe workshop to make sure that the process is, is as fair and equitable as, pro as possible. And then I'd also like to say two things about two research projects that I've been involved with. One of them is one that I was leading and that is the <clears throat> Texas A&M project looking at differential impacts of COVID-19 on faculty um, productivity. Um, this has been covered a lot in the news on um, higher education, so it's for obvious reasons there are faculty in certain groups who were disadvantaged by um, the circumstances of COVID-19. This includes faculty who have young children who are out of school and needed to be supervised when the schools were closed, but it also includes faculty um, who are doing certain types of research, whether that's research that involves human subjects, research in labs where social distancing measures change things, research that involves travel to archives or travel to field sites that was not possible for a certain period of the pandemic, which is ongoing. Um, so there's been a lot of literature on that. And one of the goals of the project was to come up with policies and practices that Texas A&M could use to ensure fair and equitable um, reviews of faculty performance to mitigate against these differential impacts. So the project informed um, our university guidelines on promotion and tenure evaluation including the optional um, inclusion of a COVID-19 impact statement, workshops on how to write those statements, workshops on how to evaluate those statements, and some guidance on how to solicit letters from external reviewers that reminded reviewers to do that in the context of the pandemic. Um, and the things that we adopted at Texas A&M have been adopted by lots of universities. There's kind of guidance out there that have been um, put out there by other people in advanced programs and, and the like. Um, the second project that I've been involved with is a collaborative research project based at the University of Houston that looks at bias in the promotion and tenure evaluation process. And this project is especially focusing on external review letters. Um, it builds on studies that have looked at the impact of one or two damaging comments from a recommendation letter for a job candidate. And it's kind of extending that same methodology to look at external review letters. And that project is ongoing. Um, next slide. So this is one slide devoted to that study, which is ongoing. We've mostly finished the data collection. The study involves 10 different universities. We've collected data from over 2,000 promotion and tenure cases, including cases at Texas A&M. One part of the study is looking at the linguistic analysis of external review letters. So this is replicating some of the methodologies that are used for those studies that are commonly cited that are looking at gender biases and racial biases and recommendation letters. And then another part of the study is just doing simple statistics on promotion outcomes because we have the outcomes at each level of review, department review, department head, our chair, and um, college committee, and college dean, and then the university review. So, so far our data suggests that women and faculty of color are much less likely to receive unanimously positive promotion votes than white faculty members and white male faculty members. 
Um, Hispanic faculty are impacted the most during both promotions. Asian faculty are impacted more for promotion to full professor. The results were about equal for the first promotion to tenure, so it was an interesting finding. And then another interesting finding, just looking at the outcome data, is that deans and department heads often reverse negative votes when there's race and gender involved. Um, and that suggests that they may be seen bias that the committees are not seen. And the study is also just looking at the power of even one negative vote to affect the outcome. So we have um, one publication, which is just an advice piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and we will be having um, other publications coming out in the near future. Christian Spitzmuller is the lead PI. Juan Madera is a, a major co-PI at the University of Houston. Erica Henderson is at the University of Houston. Michelle Penn Marshall was at Hampton College, and she recently moved to um, Texas Southern University. And those are just some of the collaborators on this project. Um, next slide. So this slide is showing some of the things that come up in our workshop, the um, strategies and tactics for retention through inclusive promotion evaluation. We look at potential bias from external review letters. That is based in part on this study that I was talking about. We look at the bias in um, how committees are formed. We look at uh, metrics for evaluating teaching and metrics for evaluating research. And I'll touch upon each of those four things. There are other things that come into play in the workshop, but the workshop is a two hour long workshop. So I'm kind of condensing it down to about 15 minutes for the rest of this presentation. So um, next slide. So one of the things we um, present in the workshop is we use this bucket metaphor to um, talk about the promotion and tenure process. Um, all departments, colleges, and universities have a written set of guidelines for promotion and tenure. In an ideal world, expectations for promotion and tenure are clearly stated, non-contentious, and widely shared. But um, coming from my own discipline of anthropology, um, I would say that a department culture does not having a department culture does not necessarily mean that everybody that is part of that culture shares the same worldview. Cultural beliefs and values are often contested. They can change over time, and um, they're not shared universally. So department guidelines might specify that a candidate for promotion should have a strong record of publication as evidenced by the quantity and quality of publications, and one member might interpret these guidelines, which are often intentionally vague and flexible. So one person may interpret it one way, another person interprets it another way. So in the Stripe workshop, we use a bucket metaphor, and this particular slide is just showing the actual expectations, like if you hit this line on the bucket, you've met expectations. If you go above that line, you've exceeded expectations. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. This slide is showing um, two different sets of buckets. The top bucket is showing that someone who's met expectations um, in all three categories and maybe just met them or maybe slightly exceeded them. And then the bottom set of buckets is showing somebody who has a really, really strong research record. But if we're going to do an honest assessment of their teaching and service records, they haven't really met the expectations. Maybe their teaching record, they don't put that much time into developing their syllabi. They don't do much uh, mentoring of undergraduate students. They don't do quality advising of graduate students. There's all sorts of examples of someone who might get by in the tenure and promotion case, but their teaching record really isn't as strong as others and really doesn't meet the expectations of what we'd like to see in teaching. And the same thing with service. This is the sort of person who avoids service assignments. If they're assigned to a committee, they, they don't do the work or they don't take on extra work. However, how this person is valued by the department when they come up for promotion and tenure would vary depending on who you ask. Some people would look at the, the bottom 
set of buckets and say, this is a superstar. This person has such an outstanding record of research. They're publishing so much. They're getting cited all the time. They've got all this grant money. They've got awards. But when you look at how they are as a colleague um, doing their share of teaching and research, they're really not meeting expectations. Um, next slide. So then there's also another type of candidate. And these are the candidates who take on extra service, including the invisible labor, the stuff that's not credited, something that you can't even put on your CV because you can't write down what it is. I met with five students who are crying in my office today. Like, how do you, you don't put that on your CV. Um, so they do an outstanding job with service. They do outstanding jobs teaching, but they may not fare as well because their research in comparison to the previous person just looks okay. Um, and some people may even say you're doing too much service. You're always, you're, you accept everything. Um, so those people might be punished in the promotion case. So this is kind of the premise behind our Stripe workshop. And, and then we go on and talk about how bias can affect um, different things. So go ahead and go to the next slide. I'll talk about the four points that I was gonna make. The first one is bias from external review letters. Um, as I've mentioned before, there's a number of studies that find that there's often bias in reference letters for um, job applicants. The studies are talking about the concept of doubt raisers. There's different comments that can come up in a, a letter for a job candidate. There is research that finds that there's gender bias as well as racial and ethnic bias and other forms of bias in these letters. And again, one or two comments can really damage how that letter is perceived by review committees. There hasn't been as much research done, or really any research done on external review letters, in part because these are intended to be fairly confidential letters. Um, our particular study has developed a, a design where we're able to maintain the confidentiality of both the letter writer, their name, and um, the candidate's name, we just have one individual at each institution that's pulling information and de-identifying things. And then it's going into a program to review, to do the similar type of linguistic analysis. Um, there's been a preliminary study that Juan Madera has um, submitted for publication based on a, um, the pilot study based just the University of Houston data, and this found that the tenure outcomes um, reflect characteristics of the reviewers more than they reflect characteristics of the candidates. So this is showing just the power of the name of who's reviewing things. And then we're also gonna look at the power of these doubt raiser comments that come up and we're again in the middle of that study. So the next slide has some best practices knowing that there can't, we know there's bias in recommendation letters. We're gonna assume that there's probably bias in external review letters, both in the way that they're perceived and the way that they're written. So the first thing is to recognize that external review letters are not free of bias. Um, they often have a lot of power in these promotion and tenure decisions. Um, people, <laughs> scrutinize them looking for the one or two negative things and then that comment goes trickles up every level of review and is assessed and interpreted and reinterpreted even if the person tries to say something positive around that comment it's just this is great but there's this one weakness or one area that this person could improve and as somebody who's written a number of um, letters and i now view them from a different perspective it's you kind of feel like your job is to include both the strengths and weaknesses. So it's natural that you're going to include some weaknesses, but the way those weaknesses that you identify play out in a promotion case can be damaging. Um, the second point is to recognize that committee members may give more weight to letters from high profile scholars. So if somebody's known to members of the committee or if they're known in the field, they can have more bias than someone who's more of an unknown letter writer. People don't know how to give weight to that person and that's really not fair. They, they were invited to write the letter because they have an area of expertise that aligns with the candidate, ideally. So their, their scholars, scholarly opinion should be valued. 
Um, another thing is to not factor in the response rates to requests for external review letters. This is a policy at Texas A&M. It's written in our guidelines, but whether it actually happens in practice all the time is harder to say. People, I have heard comments like, oh yeah, I had to invite 12 people before I could get six people to say yes. And that kind of comment can lead to just put some doubt out there that why did these people not agree to write an external review letter? Well, they didn't agree because they've got a lot of things on their plate and they just went through a COVID-19 pandemic. Like we, there's lots of legitimate reasons to say no to one of those requests. Maybe they've already accepted X number of reviews that year and they really can't take on an additional one. Um, and then the final best practice is to not let the entire case rest on a single doubt raiser comment or two comments. Okay, next slide. Um, this is the fact that bias can be based on committee composition. Case studies of faculty from historically underrepresented groups indicate that a single toxic faculty member can derail a promotion case, especially in cases where other faculty members are afraid to challenge that particular faculty member. Um, there's other comments here. Studies find that multiple observers produce more incomplete judgments than single observers. And then there's a study that had simulated PT committee discussions. And this candidate was rated the lowest by the least diverse committee. So our workshop, we've had lots of discussions of whether you like it's better to have a committee of the whole, where you've got all tenured faculty serving on the PT committee, or whether it's better to have a smaller committee that's an elected committee and the jury's still out because if you have a small committee you still can have bias if the, depending on how they're selected and individual relationships if you've got a larger committee you're more likely to have um, more people weighing in on the position obviously but you could still have higher likelihood that you'll have a toxic faculty member or two so again the jury's out on that one um, go ahead and go to the next slide. This has some best practices for committee composition. Um, one best practice is to ensure that multiple and diverse perspectives are represented. So whether you have a committee of the hall or a subcommittee may depend on the composition of your department and the, the possibility that you can have a diverse small committee. That may be the ideal if you can have it. Um, so that kind of relates to the second point. If use a subset of faculty that would include women and members of minoritized groups. And then if a candidate's doing interdisciplinary research that might not be as understood as well, it can be useful to form an interdisciplinary ad hoc committee. Um, Texas A&M policy does allow for this. Um, I'm not sure how often it actually happens. Um, next slide. Um, I've got a couple, two slides that are looking at bias in student evaluations. Um, there's numerous studies that have found that there can be significant gender biases. And the next slide will be looking at racial and ethnic biases. I'll just go through some of this quickly. Um, the study by Mengel found that both male and female students rated female instructors lower than male um, instructors. The study by McNeil. Um, found that students rated male identity significantly better than female identity. In this particular case, it was an online class and they were having, they had two different versions where a male instructor would identify as female just for the purpose of the study and then vice versa. So they were able to compare and they had kind of four different scenarios, as you can imagine, male pretending to be female, male actually being male and vice versa. So they found that the students rated male identity significantly better regardless of the instructor's actual gender. The study went by Boring found that their gender stereotypical evaluation patterns, this is the types of comments that they wrote, were very gendered. And then Wagner's study, this I believe is based in a European case um, where there was a student evaluation cutoff for promotion and found that women were less likely to attain that cutoff point. Uh, next slide, um, this is looking at race and ethnicity. Um, so this study found that the student evaluations also have bias against faculty from historically underrepresented groups and against international structures that have um, foreign accents. Um, the study by Reed and Arugette um, found that faculty from underrepresented racial groups were rated negatively more so than white faculty. 
Smith and Hawkins found that Black faculty's evaluation scores were the lowest of all racial and ethnic groups. Wang and Gonzalez found that white professors receive higher ratings than non-white and foreign professors when controlling for course difficulty. And then Fan's study found that the evaluations are biased against teachers with non-English um, first language or non-English speaking backgrounds. Um, next slide. So this one has some best practices for um, evaluating teaching records. And the first point is to don't rely too heavily on quantitative indicators from student evaluations of teaching. Um, and student evaluations of teaching usually have the statistical score and then the written comments. The written comments can also be coming from a biased perspective, especially if a faculty member is from a group that is underrepresented. And our general advice, and this is the advice that's in the Texas A&M University guidelines for tenure and promotion is to balance reference to student evaluations, to use a holistic approach that factors in other things. Um, peer reviews of teaching are commonly used and inc strongly encouraged, but there's also ways to look at a teaching record that goes well beyond the course evaluation. So look at what they're doing, how many high impact learning experiences are is the faculty member offering, um, how successful, if they have graduate students, how successful are their graduate students at getting grants, at getting their research done, at um, getting jobs after they finish their degree. Um, how active is the faculty member <clears throat> in supervising undergraduate honors theses? There's all sorts of ways to look at teaching that go beyond just looking at course evaluations. There's also ways to look at all of their teaching materials, to look at their syllabi, to look at their course assignments. How are they designing um, their syllabi? Are they decolonizing their syllabi? There's all sorts of things that go well beyond course evaluations. Um, next slide. And I'll be wrapping up soon. These are um, bias that comes from scholarly metrics. So I talked about um, H index, citation counts. These are commonly used in promotion evaluations. It does vary by discipline. Some disciplines, especially humanities, are radically opposed to using these. So you don't see them as much in those cases. And then there's other disciplines <clears throat> in the sciences that tend to like these metrics and to use them, but there still can be unfair comparisons that are made. Um, there are multiple studies that suggest that the use of journal impact factors and publication indices are problematic. Um, and this slide has some quotes from one study. Um, if you focus so much on the impact factors and citation, impact factors in particular, um, in number of publications, it, you need to look at the quality and the originality of work. The H index is not a full measure. Um, some people say it's just a, a kind of a leading indicator and it's not as good at um, judging people early in their career. <clears throat> um, next slide. Um, this is kind of following up on that. The inventor of the H index, someone named Hirsch, acknowledges that about half of the scientist community loves the H index and half hates it. And the H index of the scientist itself is a great predictor of whether he or she belongs in the first or second group. And I find this to be a funny quote because I find it to be very true for my own department of anthropology where we literally have about half of the department has to put in the H index for everybody that's coming up for promotion and the other half is trying to get it out and they have to kind of compromise and contextualize the H index, which is maybe a good solution as long as you contextualize it um, for that area of specialty and compare people to um, others who are doing the same type of work, it's okay. Um, other studies find that it limits scientific innovation if people are so are worried about questioning senior scholars who have high end. If you just kind of review them as a superstar, then you're not questioning their scholarship. Um, and then there's people that are just trying to game the system and trying to do whatever they can to make sure that they have the best H index, which generally means having as many publications, um, citing yourself, having your friends cite you. There's different ways that you can game the system. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So some best practices, again, acknowledgement, 
Acknowledging bias is where I start with everything. Acknowledging the impact factors and citation statistics are an imperfect tool for evaluating a scholar's success and impact. Um, Bruce Herbert is the person who added the second bullet point, which is when possible, use normalized citation metrics instead, such as the field citation metric. And this is where you can go into the dimensions database. Um, third, acknowledge that some forms of scholarship will have a greater impact if published in a subdiscipline journal with a lower impact factor. And fourth is to allow scholars to use alt metrics to measure social engagement with their scholarship is an alternative way of showing their impact and impacts that go beyond um, scholarly citations. Um, next slide. And this is my concluding slide. So departments and colleges can follow procedures correctly yet have practices that introduce bias. It's probably impossible to get away with these potential biases, but I think acknowledging the bias and looking for bias can, can be a useful thing to do. Um, the biases can and do accumulate in ways that disadvantage certain groups more than others. I think this is demonstrated by the first couple of case studies. Um, and again, understanding the potential biases is an important step towards undoing systemic bias. And this is what our workshop for faculty serving on PNT committees is intended to do. So having workshops like that and having um, the awareness can be helpful. I cannot say that everybody that attends my workshop um, walks away changing everything they do, but we hope, we like to think that it makes some impact. Um, and there are other ways that institutions can develop procedures, policies, and practice that can help reduce bias. And this can come in just being thoughtful about how committees are formed, being thoughtful if there's an interdisciplinary scholar, having an ad hoc committee, and other practices like that. So the next slide is just saying I'm happy to entertain questions in the remaining amount of time. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, let's all take a moment 